I hope you can see me. <laughs> um, so yes, I'll be presenting uh, this paper, HDI and Intimate Care as an Agenda for Changing Women's Health, um, on behalf of my co-authors, Rob Comber and Madeline Bellam, uh, my PhD supervisor. We're based at Open Lab. Sorry? Closer? OK, like this? Oh, OK, thanks. Um, so this is a research as it's looking at designing for women's health care as an underexplored area of HCI, particularly outside maternal health related systems. Um, it's also looking at the quality of care in key issues affecting women's health, as well as the positioning of women and their bodies within society. These concerns are first motivated by an existing technology, the speculum, which I will use um, to establish parallels with a variety of women's health issues. Uh, the main case study that you'll find in the paper is focused on urinary incontinence in, in uh, women um, and an observational work in a women's health physiotherapy consultation. So I'll briefly mention the study. Uh, I will mention technologies in use, for example. Um, there's, it, there's a lot more description in the paper if you'd be interested in looking at it. Um, I'll continue by looking at what designing for women's health and having intimate care in mind should or could consider, and I'll hand, I will end by looking at possible areas of intervention and some design provocations to sum up ways HCI can possibly have a significant contribution. So when talking about women's health, um, we contemplate issues such as menstruation and menopause, cervical or breast cancer, STDs, intimate partner or sexual violence that then might include genital, uh, female genital mutilation and reproductive freedom in terms of choice and rights. And we look at the potential for HCI to positively improve the options and experiences available to women within these varied contexts. So as I just mentioned, we motivated our concern by using the example of the vaginal speculum which is a medical gynecological instrument developed during the 19th century that has seen little design or technological improvement since then. Um, it's a medical device. It can um, be made out of plastic or metal, and it's used to dilate the vaginal walls to enable inspection of the cervix, um, usually within a consultation. Um, so the, this is a technology that uh, gets its job done, and I'm quoting Rossman here, um, its design takes little or no account for the experiences of women upon which it is used. Um, research, research does show that while this is a test which takes only minutes to perform, it is a test that is considered to be unpleasant, embarrassing, fearful, painful, or uncomfortable by most women. Some studies also challenge the conventional medic-nurse-patient uh, relationships by showing that self-insertion uh, is an acceptable innovative, simple, and cost-neutral change in clinical practice that increases women's comfort and satisfaction. And um, for example, while HCI research has looked at sex toys as a pinnacle of experiential technologies, uh, we are arguing that desi the design of tools and techniques for women's health are the opposite. They are devoid of concern for the experiential qualities of care and touch. And this work that I'm presenting here now, it's aims to open the discussion towards that. Um, so our case study. So in wanting to um, start this conversation, uh, we draw on a case study of a body disruption, urinary incontinence in women, and illustrated the experience of women's health both from the perspective of the patient and the therapist. Um, this observational study took place at a, a, a clinical specialist um, practice in women's health located um, at the local NHS research hospital. And this happened during a period of eight months um, in 2014. So basically with this field work, um, it allowed me to uh, familiarize myself with current medical practices, the assistive devices in use, approaches in dealing with patients, and a general knowledge of a wide range of medical conditions that relate to pelvic health um, care in women. Uh, so pelvic health, continence care, incontinence, 
what is incontinence? Um, in women, and I'll quote uh, Margaret Schildrick, incontinence um, is neither an illness nor strictly a medical problem. Um, it's labeled a, body description, a bodily dysfunction rather than a diagnosis, a social rather than a biological pathology. Um, so as an example, in the UK alone, it's just estimated that 14% of women have incontinence-related incontinence issues. And of course, this is accounting for the women who actually look for uh, medical support. Um, while observing uh, this practice, I had the opportunity to see the approaches used by the physiotherapist on how she was explaining pelvic floor and pelvic floor muscle exercises to um, women patients. So the way it happened most of the times was that the physio would sometimes uh, perform a manual ex exam to access the pelvic health, while other times, uh, especially if it was a first consultation, she would show um, what you see there on screen towards the right side. She would show a cross-section of the, of the um, female pelvis um, to explain um, where the pelvic floor and pelvic floor muscles were situ situated and how they should be exercised. Um, so there's a description on what, what the pelvic floor muscles are. They do support um, the, 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 the part of the body that goes from the pubic bone in the front um, to the base of the spine at the back. Um, they are the muscles in our bodies that help to hold uh, the bladder warm and bowel in place, and that help um, maintaining bladder outlet and back passage closed. So for example, uh, they are the muscles uh, that are act actively squeezed when we laugh or we cough. And if we do that, laughing or coughing without, without licking, that means our pelvic floor muscle is actually uh, strong enough to prevent the licking uh, from happening. Um, so this is just an example on how um, the physiotherapist would explain um, how to uh, do this pelvic floor muscle exercises by pointing out on the cross section. And you can see, um, I include a little animation here. Oops. Right. Just to simulate. Oops. Okay, I'm doing something wrong, sorry. Right. So just to simulate what a contraction and relaxation of those muscles um, should kind of look like, because you can see in the cross section, actually, those muscles are not present. So when, when, um, when she would explain, uh, or when she would say to imagine the vagina like a tube, start squeezing from the back passage to the front passage, do not hold your breath, squeeze, hold, count up to 10, five seconds, relax, do it three, four times a day. So this, this would be explained by looking at the cross-section, which doesn't even have uh, the muscle uh, body on it. Um, here you can see some of the devices, the technologies used for continence care. Uh, so either they're um, devices for maintaining continence, such as the vaginal cones and the probe, or to diagnose incontinence. And that can include, again, the vaginal speculum and the seam speculum. And the seam speculum is actually the medical device uh, usually used to check prolapse, which means um, checking uh, to see whether any pelvic organs, such as the bladder or uterus, um, are slipping forward or down. Um, so something that I found quite interesting at the time was that the physio actually uh, commented that for her, using this device was something that made her feel uneasy due to the, the required technique of use, um, which is the woman patient needs to be lying down and sideways, and the physio needs to insert the speculum while standing behind her, which she considered a very dominant position that doesn't allow for visual contact or engage in a conversation, and that the patient is just very submissive, and she feels like she could do anything. So basically, it is a device that gets its job done, but it is designed to be ergonomic for the people using it rather than the people receiving it. However, it doesn't really account for the experiences of either neither one. It makes both feel vulnerable um, eventually. So of course, this research embraces feminist approaches to the body and 
looks at the body as something that is understood as a site in flux. And I'll quote uh, Schildrich again, as in the body is a fabrication, it is organized not according to an historically progressive discovery of the real, but as an always insecure and, incon and inconsistent artifact which morally mimics material fix fixity. So for example, uh, being ill or unhealthy is characterized by a lack of bodily control, a body disruption that can happen at any given time and can be made visible in many different ways. Um, so there are some critical approaches across disciplines from art, design, science, and technology uh, that most recently been giving visibility to women's lived bodies. Um, one such example is the Great Wall of uh, Vagina. It's an art-based intervention that <coughs> contributes to create generalized awareness of body taboos. It elevates intimate body parts, um, which are typically confined to one's private realm. They're removed from public view. Um, it actually brings it to the white walled gallery and media in general. So it's pushing boundaries to self-knowledge and bodily awareness and highlighting the uniqueness of the body. Um, it focuses on a cultural taboo, in this case that of the vulva, the common sense vagina, quoting Eve Insler, as its main and only material. Um, which same, same but different, uh, like Labella, which I presented in an er earlier session today. Uh, Labella is an augmented system that supports intimate bodily knowledge and pelvic fitness in women. It's also using the same cultural taboo as design material, as it's looking at the external genitalia and further on into uh, the pelvic floor and uh, pelvic fitness. Um, so on the other hand, um, most of the technologies, they do configure uh, their user as a consumer and not as an active participant, though the rise of DIY approaches um, are, are, are turning um, everything a little bit more accessible and there's an opportunity for change uh, that kind of situation. So for, for example, Fit Finder, um, it's an app, it offers an alternative approach to find the finding places to um, breastfeeding women in public spaces. Um, it empowers members of that community who probably share the si similar concerns to contribute their knowledge by reviewing locations on a mobile app. Um, along the same um, lines of um, DIY um, is this uh, project, the Gynapunk Club. It's a DIY gynecology project. Um, where there's a collaboration across disciplines to develop open source tools for DIY diagnosis and first aid care in support of women to take control of their reproductive health. Um, as part of this project, um, <laughs> Gaudi Labs, or Urs Lawrence specifically, developed a 3D printable speculum, which aims, I'll quote, to democratize and liberate the instruments and protocols using obstetrics and gynecology to allow low cost diagnosis. Um, it might do so, still it is a technology that gets its job done, and we can only wonder and hope that maybe this technology will be upgraded sometime soon to improve women's experiences on this front, and um, at some point just relegating the traditional speculum for good. Uh, so the next speaker will talk about uh, this project with a lot more uh, detail, uh, but... <laughs> but um, uh, Basically, um, it was a um, hack the breast pump event in which commercially available uh, breast pumps were appropriated and reconfigured so that, it, so that they would offer a better experience for women who are using them. Uh, so in conclusion, women's experiences matter and we should stop being embarrassed about the female body and start responding to this concern. Um, HCI definitely has the potential to contribute to this space greatly and this is a positive challenge to HCI design. Um, just one example, going back to our case study of urinary incontinence in women, how about, for example, um, a technological innovation in wearable sensing, one that might combine smart textiles with analysis on where you're fitting. And I'll just leave you with some hashtags to add, add to these other hashtags spread through the building. Um, on um, topics on women's related health issues that are taboo and or underrepresented in HCI design and research.
and thank you. Questions? Hello. Um, I want to thank you for a lo lovely talk. Um, and I just wonder if you can comment a little bit. One of the things that really struck me about the situation that you were describing is, especially when you talked about the example of the sim speculum and the person who is using it being in the dominant position but feeling very uncomfortable. And um, the whole idea that empowerment in this case would be taking power away from the person in the dominant position. And I feel like that is something that has a lot of opportunities for various contexts in HCI. So I found that to be very interesting. Thank you. So, so this physiotherapist that I was um, observing, she clearly um, thinks that most of these devices need to be redesigned uh, for different reasons. Uh, the same speculum in particular because it makes her feel vulnerable because precisely that she's in full control. Um, she, doesn't ha she didn't have at the time any suggestions, so it's not like she knows what she would like to have, uh, but she knew that she was uncomfortable with it. Um, and other people I've talked with since, um, when commenting on this, they mentioned the same thing, like when they go through medical school, whether they're using it now as medics or not, at that point in time when they have to, <laughs> to uh, learn how to use it, they find it really, really awkward. Um, but it's the kind, just like the vaginal speculum, it's a technology that's been there forever, and it hasn't changed because in the end, it's all it's needed to either diagnose prolapse or diagnose what else needs to be diagnosed. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Any other questions?